Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And now we'll resume where we left off yesterday in the book, The History of Romanism by John Dowling. Currently, I believe we're in Book 5. This is Chapter 3. It's entitled, Popery, the World's Despot. Popery, the World's Despot. This portion of the, of the book uh, encompasses uh, the years from 1073 to 1303. This is vital information for God's people. These, this is history that your churches won't tell you about. Your pastors won't tell you about. And uh, there's a strategy behind hiding all this information, and that is to make Christians friendly to the Roman Catholic Church to assist in the ecumenical movement to draw all Christians back into the Roman Catholic Church, to unite all of Christianity. And uh, this has special significance for God's people when they finally come to the realization, the biblical, prophetic, and historical realization that the papacy, that which heads the Roman Catholic Church, is the Antichrist of the Bible. Okay? Okay. Now, we know he's the Antichrist. The Protestant Reformation was built upon that foundation. The papacy is the Antichrist. And uh, what little Protestantism is left in the world, we champion Protestantism here at uh, Inquisition Update. Now, I've been setting the mindset of Europe at this time. This was the turn of the first millennium. 1073 A.D., thereabouts, it was the first century after the turn of the millennium, and and all of quote-unquote Christian Europe was of the belief that Christ was imminent to return, that the judgment was at hand, that uh, this world was going to be destroyed, and everything in it. And uh, also, being Roman Catholic in their beliefs they believed in the merit in the in the system of merit for salvation no such thing as grace roman catholicism teaches you must merit you must earn salvation and so we have the whole world aimed at trying to earn their salvation or through works to expiate their sins they're all looking to become heroes and martyrs for Jesus. Now, at the same time, the so-called Holy Land, Jerusalem, Temple Mount, and Israel, Palestine as it was called at that time, was overrun with Turks. The Turks controlled Jerusalem. The Turks controlled all of the so-called holy sites of Jerusalem, even the, the, the Holy Sepulchre, as it is referred to, the gravesite of Jesus. And believing that Jesus was imminent to return, to set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, and to expiate their sins by heroic works, all of Europe was aimed toward liberating the so-called Holy Land, which was preparing to receive her Messiah to alleviate or to extirpate the heretic Turks out of the land. This is how they were going to earn their way to heaven. This is how they were going to expiate their sins. This is how they were going to have their sins removed. Now, at this point, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you have to ask, well, well, where's the sense of grace? Well, there wasn't any. They don't teach grace in the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church was, well, essentially the only church in Europe. Okay? This was before the Protestant Reformation. Now, you know that there must have been millions and millions of Bible-believing, Bible-reading people in the world who knew the truth that you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. And they weren't going to join these crusades, but they were silenced. Okay, the overwhelming majority of Europe 
were works salvation. They were Roman Catholic. And those who said you are justified by grace through faith were forced into silence. They were an extreme minority. They were regarded as heretics, and they were sought and persecuted and killed. Okay? And they weren't going to stand in the way of the Pope's Europe in the beginning of this, at the time of this crusade. All right? So now we've set the stage. The author continues now. He says, this is the top of page 261, if you're following along. He says, of many thousands who passed into Asia, that is, from Europe, Roman Catholic Europe, to Asia or the Middle East, says a, a, a recent historian of the Crusades, a few isolated individuals only returned. Okay? So they went on the crusade, but they never came home. Very few made it home. So we're talking about the depopulation of Europe. He says, of many thousands who passed into Asia, says a recent historian of the Crusades, a few isolated individuals only returned. But these every day, as they passed throughout the different countries of Europe on their journey back, spread indignation and horror by their account of the dreadful sufferings of the Christians in Judea. Okay? So the rumor was spreading by what few of the crusaders who ever returned back to Europe that Christians, that is, Roman Catholics, were suffering at the hands of the Turks all over the Middle East. Okay? So it was a crisis and it says various letters are reported as having been sent by the emperors of the East to the different princes of Europe soliciting aid to repel the encroachments of the infidel Turks. And if but very small portion of the crimes and cruelty attributed to the Turks by these epistles were believed by Christians, it's not at all astounding that wrath and horror took possession of every chivalrous bosom. Okay? Who are those who have the chivalrous bosom? Those who must earn their way to heaven, right? They must expiate their sins by going to your, in the Middle East to fight the Turks, to fight the infidel, to kill the Turks. Okay? Now, again, I reiterate, I'm not a Muslim or a Turk. I have no sympathy for their supposed God. But if they were in possession of that land, and they saw all of Europe depleting its populations to come down to fight, well, don't you think they would defend themselves? If their city of Jerusalem being inundated by Roman Catholics coming to worship at these so-called holy sites, wouldn't they see it as an invasion? Wouldn't their streets being overrun by Roman Catholic Europeans be a threat to them? National security? I mean, we certainly here in the United States understand national security, don't we? We get it preached into our ears every day on the press. Well, what about the Turks? Okay? What about the Turks? Did they have the right to protect their own te uh, territory? All of Europe was abandoning life, limb, and property and flooding down into Europe to fight these Turks. And they saw them as a threat, no doubt about it. All right? And so they defended themselves. And, of course, what few of the Crusaders ever made it back into Europe told the stories of how cruel the Turks were. Nobody ever mentions how cruel the Christians were against the Turks. Okay? Okay, the winner of every conflict writes the history. We know this to be true. What about the losers of history? Their story's never told, is it? All right. Nonetheless, you, you, you make your decision, but at least you can understand now the dynamics behind this first crusade. <clears throat> now, it says, the lightning of the crusade was in the people's hearts. That is, the people of Europe's hearts, Roman Catholic hearts, and it wanted, but it lacked but one electric touch to make it flash forth upon the world. 
Okay, all of Europe is on the very precipice of a monumental effort. Everybody's of the belief that Jesus is imminent to return to Jerusalem. It's overrun by Turks. The Roman Catholics have been taught they must earn their way to heaven. So all of Europe is is desperate to become a martyr. Okay, to fight the Turks, to clean Jerusalem of all the heretics and infidels so that it's pristine when Christ returns, right? Can you can you comp- can you comprehend the dynamics all taking place to serve one purpose? And and all it's just like having a building full of noxious fumes of natural gas and somebody standing at the light switch just about ready to flip the lights on and blow the place up. All right. Here is the the flashpoint of all of it. This is subsection 21 on page 261. It says, At this time a man, of whose early days we have no uh, authentic knowledge, but that he was born in Amains, and from a soldier had become a Roman Catholic priest, after living for some time a hermit, became seized with the desire to visiting Jerusalem. Okay? Okay, we have this military man who becomes a Roman Catholic priest who lives as a hermit. Okay, and now all of a sudden he's got this irresistible urge to travel to Jerusalem on pilgrimage. Now, Peter the hermit was his name. And according to all accounts, small in stature and mean in person. But his eyes possessed a peculiar fire and intelligence, and his eloquence was powerful and flowing. Okay, very influential person. He was small in stature. He was very poor. And and, and nothing humanly attractive about the man, but he was very eloquent, and he had a fire in his eye. Okay? He was very influential. Now, Peter the hermit accomplished in safety his pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He paid the piece of gold demanded at the gates and took up his lodging in a house of one of the pious Christians of the holy city, that is, a Roman Catholic of the holy city, Jerusalem. Here, his first emotions seem to have been indignant horror at the barbarous and sacrilegious brutality of the Turks. Okay? First thing he noticed was Turks trying to defend their property against a a horde of European Catholics coming to Jerusalem. That's what he saw. But his emotions seemed to have been indignant horror, have been indignant horror at the barbarous and sacrilegious brutality of the Turks. Now listen, he's got to be just like every other European. It's the turn of the millennium. Jesus is about to return according to their teaching and belief. And the holy city, Jerusalem, and all the holy sites have to be swept clear of these infidels in order to earn our way to heaven, right? So naturally, everywhere he looks, he's going to see horror and barbarous Uh, sacrilegious brutality by the Turks, isn't he? I mean, he's been predisposed to see this, isn't he? He's got to have a justification for killing the Turks, doesn't he? All of Europe's got to have a justification for killing the Turks, don't they? Does this remind you of the United States today? Before it claims, uh, 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 proclaims a war... Uh, or a police action, as they might call it, against some entity somewhere in the world, first they have to demonize them, don't they? The television works 24-7, 365 to give you evidence, beheadings, uh, uh, filmed uh, beheadings of people, just to strike at the horror of people, to whip up all kinds of hatred and fervor. Then your crusade might be successful, right? Right? Well, that's the function that Peter the Hermit played in the first millennium. Here, his first emotions seem to have been indignant horror at the barbarous and sacrilegious brutality of the Turks. 
the venerable prelate of Tyre represents him as conferring early or eagerly with his host, that is, the Christian with whom he stayed, upon the enormous cruelties of the infidels, even before visiting the general objects of the devotion. So he went on the pretense of going to all the holy sites. I mean, that's what every Roman Catholic did. First, you go to the the Holy Sepulchre. You go to you go to the upper room and and all these the, all of these holy sites. But Peter the Hermit was more interested, rather than going to the all the so-called holy sites, was to witness uh, the horror and the and the problem with the infidels. Okay, that was his focus when he got there. Never mind going to all these holy sites. He was there to to uh, to build a case. Let me put it that way: to build a case against the Turks. He says the venerable prelate of Tyre represents Peter the Hermit as conferring eagerly, eagerly rather, with his host upon the enormous cruelties of the infidels, even before visiting the general objects of his devotion. That was priority one to find out about the Turks. Now, doubtless the ardent, passionate, enthusiastic mind of Peter had been wrought upon at every step he took in the Holy Land by the miserable state of his brethren till his feelings and imagination became excited to almost frantic vehemence. Okay? So he saw all this supposed brutality which I interpret as being just the Turks trying to maintain control of their own land. And Peter the Hermit is whipped into a frantic state of emergency over the violence of the Turks. Now he says, upon the return of Peter the Hermit to Italy, the home of the Pope, he immediately sought the Pontiff Urban, okay, Pope Urban. And he laid before him such a touching recital of the suffering pilgrims in the Holy Land as brought tears to his eyes. He made the Pope cry. Okay? It says the general scheme of the crusade was sanctioned instantly by his authority and promising his quick and active concurrence, he sent the pilgrim to preach the deliverance of the Holy Land throughout all the countries of Europe. Okay? So Peter the Hermit becomes CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, goes to every nation in Europe and demonizes the Turks. Never once mentions that all of Christian Europe has just moved to Jerusalem to receive Jesus when he comes and are pushing the Turks out. Okay, The Turks are just trying to defend their own property. But that's not how it comes back to Europe. It comes back to Europe that the Turks are killing Christians, beheading Christians. See, can you just imagine Fox News, CNN, and all this showing beheadings of Christians? It happened in our day, didn't it? Same thing. And what did we do? We went on a crusade in the same Middle East that they were fighting at the first millennium. It's starting to ring a bell. Okay. Wonderful, vital history, isn't it? Very, very instructive. This is exactly why George W. Bush called it exactly what it is, a crusade. And that's exactly what it was. Now, he was chastised by his Roman Catholic hierarchs in Washington, D.C. You don't want to let the cat out of the bag. You better start calling it a, you know, a, a, a war of liberty. Yes, peace. Democracy, that's what you call it. You don't call it a crusade. That might wake up the Protestants, okay? That might wake up Bible-believing Christians, and especially if they have uh, some comprehension of history, all right? You see why they've erased all this history from the church libraries? This is why we can't make sense of what is going on before our very eyes today, on the television, on every channel. If somebody from the first century were to witness the television reports today in our generation, they would instantly recognize it as another crusade, because that's exactly what it is. 
The same crap goes on today that went on a thousand years ago in Europe. Only now it's the United States of America. And you would think somebody would have the courage to stand up and tell this country the truth about it. Well, I'm not qualified to reveal all the truths because I would spend 24-7, 365 days of my life investigating this thing, and I don't have the time or the resources. So what do I do? I depend upon the historians who recorded all these very same things that took place a thousand years ago. Let them be the experts. I'm just a mouthpiece. All right? Now, Peter wanted or lacked neither zeal nor activity. From town to town, from province to province, from country to country, he spread the cry of vehemence on the Turks and deliverance to Jerusalem. Okay? There's your holy war. To appease the wrath of Almighty God, to be forgiven of our sins, we must earn our way to heaven, we must abandon Europe, everyone who calls himself a Christian must go on this holy war to liberate the Holy Land from the, the infidels in preparation for Christ's return. And if we earn martyrdom, we earn heaven. Okay? This is how you make, you make salvation with Jesus. You prove yourself to be a martyr in a holy war against the Turks to cleanse Jerusalem, the holy city, in preparation for Christ's return. I hope I've painted a picture of what it was really like a thousand years ago. And you can certainly understand the same kind of vehemence that was generated by the mainstream media that, that, that you might liken unto Peter the Hermit. The mainstream media of this country whipped this country into a fervor, to, a religious fervor, to go and, and clean up the heretics and the infidels out of the Middle East. Okay? And what are they planning? A futurist return of Christ, right? The 70th week of Daniel, okay? The seven-year period? The mid in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease? That's what all this activity, military activity is in the Middle East. It's the same stuff, different millennium. <clears throat> All right, Peter the hermit lacked neither zeal nor activity. From town to town, from province to province, from country to country, he spread the cry of vengeance on the Turks and deliverance to Jerusalem. Just like our uh, current crusade, right? And said the warlike spirit of the people, listen to that, the warlike spirit of the people was at its height. And I've just described to you why. Everybody wants to be a martyr. The genius of chivalry was in the vigor of its early youth. The enthusiasm of religion had now a great and terrible object before it. And all the gates of the human heart were open to the, the eloquence of the preacher, Peter the Hermit. The eloquence was not exerted in vain. Nations arose at his word and grasped the spear, and it only wanted someone to direct and point that great enterprise that was already determined, and this was accomplished by the eloquence and zeal of Pope Urban at the Council of Claremont. The Council of Claremont. We're going to talk more about that when we turn from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Stay tuned. Come back. You just have to know the truth about history in order to understand the present and the future. We'll be back right after this. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com. 
and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio who sponsors it. All right, subsection 22. Peter the Hermit, the then MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, you name it, has whipped Europe into a frenzy over the Turks and their atrocities against Roman Catholics in Jerusalem. Jesus is about to return. Everybody wants to expiate their sins. And to return to my analogy that I use later, with the help of Peter the Hermit, the house is now full of the noxious fumes of natural gas. It's ready to blow. The smallest little spark is all it's going to take to set it off. And now all we need is somebody to walk in and put his finger on the light switch. Guess who it is? Pope Urban. Pope Urban. He's allowed and instructed Peter the Hermit to educate and to terrorize all of Europe in preparation for a holy Roman Catholic crusade in Europe. Now, something else I want to point out. Here we are, a thousand years previous today, 1073 A.D. The Pope wants control of Jerusalem, doesn't he? Why does the Pope want control of Jerusalem? Well, I've explained it to you a thousand times, but I'll do it again. The papacy, in order to shed the onus of Antichrist away from itself, which the scriptures clearly implicate 
the papacy and no one else, of being the Antichrist of the Bible. The papacy throughout its history has constantly, forever, tried to shed the onus of Antichrist away from itself onto someone else. And they chose early on that the, da the prophecies of Daniel, particularly chapter 9, were not fulfilled by Jesus Christ a thousand years previous to this time, but that an Antichrist will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, right? A future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th prophecy, 70-week 70 prophecy. Okay? This is how the Roman Catholic Church has always silenced dissent within the Roman Catholic Church. Those in the Roman Catholic Church who read the Scriptures, if they had access to the Scriptures, they read it and understood that the papacy is the only candidate for Antichrist. There isn't anybody else co to compete for the position. It was an undeniable fact. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and that's what they preached. And so every time this rumor began to spread among the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church had to go on damage control. They had to shed the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy. So they taught that the Antichrist was Nero of the distant past. Or they taught that Antichrist had not yet come in the world. That the Pope cannot be the Antichrist. So stop your harping about the Pope being the Antichrist. He's the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. You blaspheme God when you call the Pope the Antichrist. Okay, this is how they silenced the Church of Jesus Christ who came to the undeniable conclusion in the Scripture that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. This is why the popes went on crusades against Bible-believing Christians. This is why the papacy denied the scriptures to the people they weren't allowed to. They made it a criminality to own and possess and to read the scriptures. They had to get the scriptures out of the people's hands, Roman Catholics and non-Roman Catholics alike. Because anybody with any competence who reads the scriptures can come to only one conclusion. The papacy is the Antichrist. The Bible was a poison book to the papacy. Okay? And while he was denying the Scriptures to everyone else, the Pope was reading the Scriptures and trying to figure out a way to finally shed the onus of Antichrist away from itself and onto someone else. So they came up with two alternative schools of Bible prophecy, that the Antichrist was a figment of the distant past, one of the ancient Roman Caesars, Caligula or Nero, and if somebody didn't happen to buy that load of malarkey, well, they have a choice. They can believe that the Antichrist is of the distant future, just before Christ's return. Well, look, Christ is about to return, isn't he? According to their understanding... It's the turn of the millennium. Jesus is about to return. So the Pope has to have possession of Jerusalem, doesn't he? Okay? They have to have control of Temple Mount and all the other holy sites. Maybe to build a Jewish temple there again and offer animal sacrifices and then have some antichrist figure of, of their choosing to come and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease then the Pope could present himself to the world as the Christ, right? Well, that's what he wanted to do anyway. That's what he'd been doing for a thousand years already. You see, I look at this as the first attempt to fulfill the first, uh, rather, the, the first attempt to f have a second fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. The Pope literally must have control of Jerusalem. But it's overrun by Turks. So all of Catholic Europe must serve the Pope in order to ex expiate their sins and join this crusade against the Turks to earn their salvation. Now the Pope intends to uh, damn all the people 
by presenting himself as the Christ. All right? That's the greatest secret of the Roman Catholic Church. I've just revealed it to you. Many of you have been listening for a long time. You've come to this conclusion. Many are still struggling with it. But I intend to make it as easy as possible to understand what the papacy has been about ever since its beginning. To present itself in a credible fashion to all the world to be the vicar of Christ. Sweet Christ on earth. All right, that's the, been the whole object of the papacy from the very beginning. From the very beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. Satan has been at the head and has steered the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church to that eventual end for nearly 2,000 years, all throughout the Christian era. Subsection 22, page 261, says, The following account of the address which the Pope delivered on this occasion is derived from the relation given by Robert the monk who was present. Okay? This is Robert the monk who was present at the time when Pope Urban made his, his big speech. You know, he's got his finger on the light switch. Going to blow the place up. He says, after having completed the other business of the council, remember we're talking about the Council of Claremont, after they had finished the, the main business of the council, and which occupied the deliberations of seven days, Pope Urban came forth from the church into one of the public squares, as no public building was large enough to hold the immense concourse of people, and addressing the multitude as the peculiar favored of God, the peculiarly favored of God, <laughs> in the gifts of courage and strength and the true faith, he began to depict in glowing terms the miseries of the Christian pilgrims in the Holy Land. Okay? Everybody had already been prepared to receive this message from Pope Urban. Pope Urban, remember, is the one who sent Peter the Hermit. CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, all over Europe to whip the people into a frenzy. And here comes Pope Urban, ready to flip the switch. Okay, he told them that their brethren, their so-called Christian brethren, there in the Holy Land were trampled under the feet of the infidels to whom God had not granted the light of his Holy Spirit. That fire, plunder, and the sword had desolated the fair plains of Palestine, that her children were laid away captive and enslaved, or died under tortures too terrible to recount, that the Christian females were subjected to the impure passions of the pagans, and that God's own altar, the symbols of salvation, now you have to know what he's talking about here, he's talking about the Eucharist, the Jesus cookie, all the images and idols of the Roman Catholic Church, and all of their icons or their... Uh, uh, what's the word I want? I'm, I'm searching for the common word for the uh, remains of dead saints that they place underneath the altars uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. We've talked about it so many times. I'm just having a, uh, a brain fade here. But he's accusing the, the the Turks of going into Roman Catholic churches and subjecting the Eucharist to abuse and desecrating the altars of the Roman Catholic churches and desecrating the uh, remains of dead saints that are buried with, with, within the altars of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? This is the last straw in a Roman Catholic. There's been many instances throughout history when Jews or some other so-called heretic or infidel breaks into a Roman Catholic church and desecrates the Eucharist. This is the, this is the stuff of holy wars. This is what provokes the Roman Catholic church to go on crusade. All right? So this is what he's telling you. Christian women are being abused 
by the Turks. I won't elaborate, but you, you know what this is about. It says that the Christian females were subjected to the impure passions of the pagans and that God's own altar, the symbols of salvation, that is the Eucharist and the, the images and idols in the Roman Catholic Church, and the, 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 uh, I still can't come up with the name of it, in, uh, the buried underneath the altars, and the pre- there it is, the precious relics of the saints were all desecrated by the gross and filthy abomination of a race of heathens. Okay? This is a religious war. The Pope's got his finger on the switch. And he says, to whom then, he asked, to whom did it belong to punish such crimes? to wipe away such impurities, to destroy the oppressors and to raise up the oppressed, to whom, if not to those who heard him, who had received from God strength and power and greatness of soul, whose ancestors had been the prop of Christendom, and whose kings had put a barrier to the progress of infidels. Think, he cried, of the sepulcher of Christ our Savior, possessed by the foul heathen. Think of all the sacred places dishonored by the sacrilegious impurities. That land, too, the Redeemer of the human race, rendered illustrious by his advent, honored by his residence, consecrated by his passion, repurchased by his death, signalized by his sepulcher. That royal city, Jerusalem, situated in the center of the world, held captive by infidels who deny the God that honored her, now calls on you and prays for her deliverance. From you, from you above all people, she looks for comfort, and she hopes for aid, she hopes for aid since God has granted to you beyond other nations glory and might in arms." Take then the road before you in the expiation of your sins. Listen carefully. Take then the road before you, that is the road leading to Jerusalem, in expiation of your sins, and go assured that after the honor of this world shall have passed away, imperishable glory shall await you even in the kingdom of heaven. Unquote. The light has just been switched on. Europe is going to Jerusalem. The First Crusade. Millions are going to die. Many Roman Catholics of Europe will never see Europe again. The earth is going to be soaked with blood. Kind of reminds you of today, doesn't it? There's nothing new under the sun. The kings of the earth today use this turn of the first millennium as an example of how they can whip the people into a frenzy, how they can demonize another race or creed of people, and incite the whole world to a holy Roman crusade. And if someone accidentally in stupidity calls it a crusade, They have to shut him up right away. Because it hasn't been so long since the books that I'm reading here on First Amendment Radio were read in all the churches. They haven't been read in the churches for over a hundred years, but that's all it takes for the people to become ignorant again. And here we know, now we understand what happened after 9-11. So who's responsible for 9-11? I'll let you ponder that one. But you know what role CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, CNN, all of them, what role they played? They played the role of Peter the Hermit. And they say this war will never end. You know why it will never end? Because Christ is imminent to return. The papacy only has but a short period of time to perpetrate her futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy of Daniel's prophecy, the 70th week of Daniel. 
It's just like what happened at the in the upper room at the at the Lord's table. Jesus said to to uh, Judas, "What thou must do, do quickly." Judas betrayed him, but he only had a short period of time because Christ's crucifixion was imminent. The time had come. Jesus said, "What thou must do, do quickly." And that's the situation the Pope's in right now. If there's ever going to be a, 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 a credible delusion of the people by fomenting a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, they better do it quickly. And they're working 24-7, 365. They failed in their first crusade, but they intend to succeed in their second crusade in the Middle East. And for a thousand years, God has kept putting monkey wrenches into the works. Why? Because we're supposed to hold our faith, hope, and trust into the first fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, that which occurred 2,000 years ago. And it was not the Antichrist, but it was Jesus Christ who made a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life. And God confirmed that he was the Messiah when he ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom. And open the Holy of Holies for you and me. Jesus became the great high priest. There is not one article of Daniel's prophecy that isn't recorded as having been fulfilled. Not in some history book written by man. But in the New Testament itself. All you have to do is read Daniel's prophecy over and over and over until you've memorized it and the very words that he used in that prophecy and then read the New Testament for yourself. You'll find it all right there. And at that point, for anyone to suggest to you that there's a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, you know they're lying. You know they're deceived. And yet here we are in our generation, the whole world is deceived, expecting a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week and the papacy working just as fast as it can, day and night, with the help of all the kings of the earth, to accomplish it. Not so that the world will receive Jesus when he returns, but that the whole world will receive the Pope as the Christ before Jesus returns. Have I made sense? Are you getting it? Listen, there's nothing special about me. I'm just an Iowa plowboy. I can barely read. I've got the same lack of education that everyone else in the United States has. I struggle to read some of these books and to understand what it says, especially after 50 years of being indoctrinated that the 70th week of Daniel's yet future, by every pastor and minister and Bible prophecy instructor that I've ever listened to, the most famous names in Christianity all, like frogs, repeat the same message. Futurism, futurism, futurism. And if it weren't for the Spirit of Almighty God, I'd still be a futurist. If it weren't for the grace and mercy of Almighty God, I would still be a futurist because nobody preaches historicism anymore. But the Antichrist is historical, not future. And he's not from the ancient past of the pagan Roman Empire, nor the, the, the Grecian Empire, nor the, nor the Medo-Persian Empire. He's from the Roman Empire. And he arose shortly after the apostles all died. Right after the Caesars of the Roman Empire left their power and authority and jurisdiction to the popes. In the so-called donation of Constantine, 
and the popes have ruled and reigned in the Christian world all throughout the Christian era, deceiving God's people. What mercy has been shed upon me to know the truth? Now all I can hope to do is to share that truth with others and let the Holy Spirit convict. Let the Holy Spirit witness. But the Pope's going to send all of Europe, all of quote-unquote Christian Europe on a holy Roman crusade in the Middle East. History is going to record it so that the world might have a witness of who this man of sin is and how he operates. And that's why they've taken these histories out of the, out of the churches and out of the schools and out of the press. What a privilege it is to be on First Amendment Radio to read these books. I only hope I have blessed you as much as being here blesses me. Subsection 23, at this point in the oration of the Pope, loud shouts are said to have burst simultaneously from the assembled multitude as if impelled by inspiration, as if impelled by inspiration. Quote, it is the will of God, it is the will of God, unquote. Words regarded as so remarkable that they were employed as the signal of rendezvous and the watchword of battle in their future adventures. Skillfully seized upon this simultaneous burst of enthusiasm and turning it to good account, the Pope proceeded as soon as the silence was obtained. Quote, Brethren, if the Lord God had not been in your souls you would not all have pronounced the same words. Or rather, God himself pronounced them by your lips. For he it was that put them in your heart. Who was the God that the Pope was talking about? The God of glory or the little God in Rome? I think you all know the answer to that one. We'll continue with this discourse of this diabolical pope, the first crusading pope, when we return to the broadcast tomorrow. You've been listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. I'll see you then. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. 
That's crossthborder.org.